You should uh, throw me one. We're good? All right, cool. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Marvelous. Uh, so uh, this is Someone Like You, Dependent Pairs in Haskell, a talk by Sandy McGuire. Uh, that's me. Um, <laughs> my website is reasonablypolymorphic.com, and the slides here are available there if you want to follow along. If you don't, that's okay, but maybe you should share it on social media, tell all your friends. It's going to be great. Um, and so uh, the, the talk kind of today is we're going to, for lack of a better term, um, we're going to use what I would describe as type level wizardry uh, <laughs> in order to uh, constrain our, our, our problems. We're going to write some, uh, some very simple things and you're see like, oh, hey, this doesn't really work um, in a way that is like extensible and um, it's going to be prone for error if we do a lot of it. Um, and so the idea is if we can, um, if we can constrain our types really uh, tightly, that means that there's actually only going to be one implementation of the program we want, which means the compiler is actually going to be smart enough to write it for us. And that's kind of the dream, is if we can get the compiler to do our job for us, we just have to do some thinking and it does all the coding. That's the goal. Um, so uh, before we start, um, if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, please just raise your hand and let me know. Um, if you don't understand something, probably that means I've done a bad job of teaching, and that probably means uh, someone else in the room doesn't. And so it'll be great if we'll just clear all these things up. Um, however, if you have like a fun anecdote you'd like to share, or uh, if you think I'm stupid or wrong, um, I would like to hear that as well, but let's talk about it afterwards. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so without further ado, someone like you. Um, so we're going to build a uh, somewhat real life example. Um, I want to build like a, a life tracking uh, app. So I'm going to like import a bunch of data and then like maybe try to do some mining on it later and say, oh, on Wednesdays I, uh, I listen to more music or something. Um, I don't know what the, the value is. So that's why it's an almost real life example. Um, the thing is, I'm not actually going to build this uh, life tracking app. What I'm going to do is build the, the data ingestion pipe of it. Um, and so we're going to build a thing. So for each kind of like thing I want to track, um, it's going to be what we call an event. And that's going to have some associated payload. Um, and so kind of a priori, I'm going to have a schema of um, these types that I want. And each kind of event is going to have a different payload associated with it. Um, and so because I'm a, a Web 2.0 guy, I'm going to have an API for this. And uh, it's going to be RESTful. And so for, there's going to be an endpoint for each type of event I want to import. Um, and then I'm going to pack it up and send it downstream so someone else can deal with it. And so that's kind of the thing. I want to import data, type check it, and then send it downstream. And if we can build that, then that's, that's the goal of today. Um, the thing is, we have a marketing team. And they say, this thing has to be huge, right? Um, and so by the end of the year, we want to be able to import 500 different events. Um, and so today, we're just going to have like three different events. And that's going to be enough to show how much work it will be. Um, but if there's 500, like, that's a lot of work, right? Um, there's only 300 and some amount of days in a year. And so if I'm doing this every day for a year, that's like one and a half I need to write a day. And if we're only looking at like business, business days, like that's a lot more work I'm doing. And um, the idea is like probably a lot of it's going to be boilerplate and repetitive and annoying. Um, and if that's like your day job, that means you're going to get bored and you're going to stop paying attention. And um, that's going to lead to bugs, right? And the thing is, like, if we're doing it this rapidly, these are going to be hard bugs to find. And so it'd be nice if we just can prevent ourselves from writing them in the first place. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, so uh, we're going to start with like a really, really kind of simple, naive example and um, see why it falls down and kind of build on from there. Um, uh, and yeah, so any boilerplate is bad. Um, so our first attempt is. Our reasoning is, if we want to push these things into a pipe downstream, it probably it should be a typed, uh, typed like pipe. And so uh, that the type of that pipe will be event, uh, right? And so the event is kind of made up of these three. It's a co-product of the types of events I want to import. And so uh, for the three we're going to use today is wake up um, with no data associated with it, or I can eat a meal, or I can like rock out to some song for some amount of time. And I don't know why I chose these. Uh, I was just, I think these are the first three things I did on the day I wrote the slides. Who knows? Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, so this is kind of the, the data type we're going to be dealing with. And um, if we want to be able to ingest these things through our API, we're using JSON, and so we need a from JSON instance for these things. Um, so I can say I've got a from JSON instance which says I know how to deserialize my event out of JSON, right? And the logic here is I'm going to try to parse it as a wake up thing. And if that fails, then I'll try to parse it as an eat thing. And if that fails, I'll try to parse it as a rock out thing. Um, and so like, this is maybe a little naive, but like, you know, this works. And I've seen this in, in production. And so like, people do write code that looks exactly like this. Um, and so you know, 
probably you agree that this will give me an event, right? If, if this thing is valid, it'll give me one of the three. Um, and so I need to write an API. And uh, if you're uh, familiar with Servant, this will look good. And if you're not, um, essentially Servant is a way of expressing an API as a type. And so um, I can write my API in the type system and then implement it. And then the compiler will tell me if I implemented it correctly according to the spec. Um, and so there's a lot of noise here. So we say we have an API which is slash API, uh, slash event, and then slash either wake up, eat, or rock out. Each of which takes the same request and returns the same response, or types, right? Um, so the request is actually a JSON blob with no, uh, I don't really know what it means yet. And I'm going to return some response which I don't care about because we don't care what we're responding. We just want to ingest data. So that's what we want. Um, and so if we have this API, we need to implement the endpoints. And uh, we, we write this function here, which takes a value. This is the JSON blob. And it returns some response and some monad that who cares, right? Um, so I've got this JSON blob, and I attempt to deserialize it as JSON. If that fails, I just throw it as an error, and it gives like a 500 or something. And in the success, I kind of package it up into my response and do whatever I will with it, right? Um, and so uh, this actually turns out to work. Um, I can implement my server in terms of this endpoint. So I say each endpoint in my API description is running this event or import event code. So every endpoint is running the same code, but it works because uh, we haven't really told it that it shouldn't work, right? Um, so this this works, uh, but it, it's not type safe, right? I can send um, a wake up event to the to the eat payload, or I guess vice versa, or anything, right? Any combination of things will work. And so I can send the wrong data to the endpoint, and it'll happily accept it and still ingest it. And like, maybe that's not a problem, right? Maybe we just don't document that feature, and uh, it, we get on with our day, and we don't. We feel a little nervous about it, but it's fine. Um, but there's actually a bigger problem here, which is um, that from JSON instance we wrote is nasty. It doesn't work in the way that we'd like it to behave. Um, because the problem is it, it tries to parse these things sequentially, right? And so it tries the first one, and if that fails, then it tries the second one, and, it and then it tries the third one. Um, so what happens if I send like a wake-up payload, and it's like just barely misformed? It fails the parsing, and so then it tries the next thing, and it tries the next thing. Um, but the error message I get out of that is it says, this is not a rock-out event. I'm like, what? I sent you an eat event to, my, to the eat payload, or to the eat uh, endpoint. It's like, why? Why is it telling me about this rock out thing? And so what I've done is like somehow because of my lack of type safety, I'm leaking error messages that I shouldn't be leaking. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a negative user experience, and that's a bad thing. Uh, the good news is we can do better, right? And so the problem is we just had this one type. And so if we split it into multiple types, we could just do more logic, and that would solve our problems. Um, so that's going to be our first, uh, our first attempt at this. So we used to have this big event type, which kind of had this data. Um, in a single type. So we can pull it out into separate uh, payloads. And so I say, I've got this payload of wake up data, and it's just the constructor, right? Um, versus I've got this payload of eat, and it takes a meal. And so this thing is completely isomorphic to the original thing I wrote, except it's in three types instead of one type. Um, I say that each one has its own from JSON instance, and so I, know I don't have to worry about this like failover problem, right? Uh, that's great. That's great. And so, uh, but I still want to be able to package these things into my event, um, and so I can send it downstream. So I just reconstruct uh, my original thing out of, tr out of these new types I've written, right? So I still have this event wake up uh, event tag, which takes a payload wake up. And so um, I, I still have all the, the things I had before, except I had to do a little more work in order to uh, get the type safety I wanted. Um, I also make some prisms here. And if you're not familiar with prisms, essentially it's a way of uh, getting in and out of a, a coproduct. And so, um, we, we'll, we, we're just going to drive some, some type safety here, but it's not super important. Um, we're going to also get rid of this like, pretty quickly. Um, so if you don't know about uh, optics, they're super good. They're worth learning about. I would check them out. We're not going to do it today. Uh, so they provide type safety for us in the sense of um, if we have some of these, uh, these payloads, we can use our prism to push it through this constructor and get an event. And so um, it kind of gives us a function that takes one of these things and gives me back an event. And so that kind of just uh, packages these things up for me. So I've changed that type, so I need to change my endpoint, right? Um, so now my endpoint takes a prism um, from an, an event to an E. And I say that I have some from JSON E, right? I know how to deserialize an E. I don't know what E is, but I don't really care. I know how to get from an E into an event, right? So I take this prism, and I, I do my old logic. And now um, I have some E here, right? I don't know what this thing is. It's of type E. Uh, but I don't care because I can push it into an event. And so I use review to the, through my prism that pushes it through the prism, and now I have an event uh, that was generated from this thing. Um, 
And so uh, we need to change our server. And so now each of our import events actually is we curry it with the prism we want. And so you notice that this says wake up, and this says wake up. And so now these things are kind of tied, right? Um, and actually, this solves our problem, where we can't, um, we, now, if you try to send the wrong payload to the wrong endpoint, it'll, it'll fail. And it'll give you the error message saying, oh, you didn't give me the type I expected, which is, which is great, right? Um, and so, yeah, so we've gained type safety. Uh, and that's nice. Um, but the compiler doesn't know that these new payload types are related to one another. We know that because we're humans and we put the same word in front of each of our types. Um, and that's enough to convince us as humans, but the compiler doesn't care, right? These are all just opaque strings and it doesn't ever look into them. Um, and so it seems like if the compiler knew that these types were related, then we might be able to pull additional uh, boilerplate out of this, right? Um, and so that's, that's kind of our next step. Um, and yeah, so we can get more tr clever tricks. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to start with our first type sorcery uh, intermission. And we're going to talk about data kinds and type families. Um, and uh, it, it'll tie in, right? So um, the first thing is a data kind. It lifts a value into a type. And it turns a type into a kind. And you're probably wondering, what does that mean? <laughs> and uh, so we can run through it really quickly. We can say, I have a data type called Boolean, right? This is a type, and it has values true and false. And data kinds uh, moves that into the kind system. And the kind system is like the type system of the type system. It kind of tells you when your types are like well-formed or like meaningful in the right context. Um, and so what data kinds does, it turns my type Boolean into a kind Boolean. And here we're using um, this kind of cursive font to say this is a kind, um, because syntactically there's no differentiation between types and kinds except where they can live. And so if you're not super like familiar with this stuff, it's going to be confusing. So I've just cursifies it. Um, the other thing is, uh, so we, we construct this kind, right? And it has internal types. The types are of kind bool, and the types themselves are true and false. Uh, we call these lifted true and lifted false, and that's what this tick indicates. Um, and so these things are, are not values, right? These don't exist at runtime. They can only possibly exist in the type system. Um, and they're both of kind uh, true, uh, sorry, they're both of kind bool. Usually we talk about kind star, and that's the, the kind of things that have representations at runtime. And so it won't even kind check if you try to like make a value of these things. Um, and so that, that is a thing. So these can only possibly ever exist at the type system. They never exist at runtime. And so the question is like, why would you want that, right? Um, uh, and so what it allows us to do is some like bookkeeping later. And it ties nicely into our discussion of type families. And a type family is essentially a function that returns a type. It takes a type and it returns a type. Um, and that's cool. So these things necessarily have to live at the type system because types don't exist at the value level, right? Um, and so we've got this silly example here, right? I've got this type family called not int, and it takes some type t. And if that t is an int, I've said it's not an int, so I'm going to return a, a unit type, right? Otherwise, uh, if you give me an a, I'll just give you back the a. So I can kind of pattern match on this type, and if it's the one I don't want, I'll just give you something else. So I can say foo is of type not int boolean. And then I can say foo is equal to true, right? And so um, this type checks. And this is because I look at this, and I kind of go through my, my patterns, and I say, is it not int of int? No, it's not. So it must be this not int of a. And so it returns a Boolean. So this thing is actually a foo of uh, bool. Um, but this one, we say bar is of type not int int. And int is uh, an int, right? So that's this pattern here. It's really hard to select on this. And that returns a unit. And so I have to say that this thing is a unit. If I try to set the thing to like seven, it will not type check and it will not compile. Question. Sure. Is this to a kind? Is this just checking, keeping track of the count? Or is it actually keeping track of something else beyond the count? Uh, so the oh, there, there's no kinds here. These, these are all just standard types. Oh, sure. Yeah. What do you mean by the counts? Oh yeah, so so that is the default kind system, and now I've extended the kind system. So instead of just kind star, we also have kind bool, and the bool is not a star. So if you ever try to use a bool or a star, they they just won't kind check. Yeah. Uh, good, but good question. Thank you. Um, so type families only exist at the uh, the type level, right? And so uh, this is essentially it. We can write our type families over our data kinds, right? Because these things. Um, we can, they're just functions at the, at the type level. And so 
uh, my data kinds exist at the type level, so I can write a function over them uh, to return a different type. And uh, that's really the trick, right? Uh, so we're going to go back to our regularly scheduled talk. And um, you've probably all forgotten about what we were talking about previously. And uh, what we were trying to do was um, teach the compiler that all of our payload types were related. And um, probably if we're, uh, if we're all kind of keeping up, that we, we have some idea of how we can do that. We can write this type family, and that um, is some evidence that these things are related somehow, because we have this function that relates them, right? Um, so I turn on data kinds, and I turn on type families. And I say, I have this event type, um, and it's an enum of wake up, eat, and rock out. And so this is like the types of events I want to ingest, right? Um, this used to be kind of constructors, and now it's, it's just like this enum. This is just plain value level enum. Um, but with data kinds, it gives me a kind event type, right? And so I can say, I have this data, fun or this, uh, data family, right, um, over payload. And what it does is it takes some event type, which I don't really care about, and it gives me back a type. Um, and so uh, if you're not super following, probably an example will help. I can say, um, I have a data instance, which is kind of like um, is adding a pattern to my, to my type function. I say, I have this type, and it's called payload wake up, right? And it has a constructor called payload wake up. I also have uh, payload eat, and that has this thing. And so this is completely, again, isomorphic to all those types we wrote by hand, except uh, there used to be no space and no tick here. That's really the only difference. Um, but now this is kind of parameterized over a function. Um, and so these things are types in their own right, because we can say, um, I have a from JSON instance over my payload wake up, right? And these things are absolutely types um, and that, like, of kind star. And uh, so now that I've done this, I can actually uh, use it. Oh, hi, sorry. So from the, the bullet point of view, should you print the so-called event by the event kind? Um, maybe. So uh, the question was uh, event type, to, should I call it event kind? Um, yeah, because it's used as a kind. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, it will be used as both. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, and at some point, we're going to blur the line between what is a type and what is a kind. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a meaningless question at some point, but <laughs> thank you for asking. <laughs> um, so yeah, so now that we've, uh, we've kind of taught the compiler that these things are related, um, what we can do is that we can actually generate that old event type we had, that big coproduct. We can get that for free. Um, and so I, I need to turn on gadgets, which uh, we'll discuss in a second. And so I say, I have this type event, and it has a constructor called make event. And what it does is it takes some payload over event type. I don't care what it is, as long as it's um, some event type. And what I can do is I can pack that into event, right? Um, so essentially, it's just it's a, it's a wrapper around this type here. And so this is kind of existential, right? I don't really care what type of payload it is. I just know that it's, um, it's a payload over my event type. And so I can sort. And so this is exactly that, um, that code product I had before, where I had to like, explicitly list every um, option of types I wanted. But now I, I don't have to anymore. And so this is cool, right? I've, I've stripped out a bunch of boilerplate I used to have to write. I'd have to write like a new data type and then update this, uh, my old code product, so it would have that in it. I have to update my API definition, and then I have to update my API implementation. And it's like 500 things there. I've cut out like a quarter of my work just by, with this one trick, right? Pretty cool. But I need to make a compile still. And we have to turn on a whole bunch of spooky things, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> because we're really doing things that the, the type system was never meant to do. And so we're, we're fighting it, and it's fighting back, but we're going to win. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so I say I've got for any et of type or of kind event type, um, we can do this as long as I have a from JSON instance over that payload, right? Um, I can take a JSON blob and give you back a response, right? And the logic isn't very is not very different. Um, the thing is, I need to annotate what type I expect to get out of this thing because nowhere at the value level now does it know what uh, what type of thing I should be parsing this as. So I say I have this et that I've parsed successfully, and it is of kind uh, or sorry, it's of type payload et. I don't know what ET is, but it doesn't really matter. And once I have that, I can stick it uh, into my event type via the make event constructor. And so uh, this is it, right? Uh, and you're, so um, the question is like, what are these, these language extensions? Why do we need them? Um, we need scope type variables in order to get this ET in scope. Um, and so what this does is it just keeps this type variable in scope for the rest of the function so that I can refer to it here, right? And I need this in scope so I can say that uh, I have this from JSON proof, right? I know that I can deserialize this thing because I know when I from JSON it, I'm going to get this type back. And so I need that scope type variable and I'm able to say that I, I'm allowed to parse this thing. I need kind signatures to say what kind I expect this to be. And then I also need allow ambiguous types. And this is by far the spookiest of uh, these things. 
And if you actually look at like at the value level, um, this type doesn't describe what what uh, type it wants to parse, right? It says, you give me a JSON blob and I'll give you back a response. And nowhere in that is ET. Um, and so if you try to compile it, it'll say, nope, that's ambiguous. I don't know what ET is, so I'm not going to write it for you. Um, and we just say, we're going to ignore that complaint. We're, gonna just, we're allowed to do this. It's fine, right? <laughs> um, and so, uh, so that gets us around that problem. Um, is there any gotchas? Sorry? Are there any gotchas? There are no gotchas. Because uh, we're just going to solve the problem on the very next slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so on the next slide, I need to uh, fill in that type parameter somehow. And so what I can do is turn on type applications, which allows me to, send, to um, explicitly fill in a type variable um, without having to pass anything at the value level. Um, and so that syntax is I have this at sign, and then I can apply a type to this function, right? So I'm applying this wake up type uh, to my function import event. And so what this does is it says, I want to fill in this et type with that variable or with that type. And so this completely solves the problem. You used to have to use like a proxy in order to do this. Um, and I think this is just a cleaner, nicer way of doing that. Um, and so yeah, so now I can say each of these things, uh, import event, right? And I just say, OK, I'm going to fill in these variables. That makes this unambiguous. And now each one of these is well typed or, and strongly typed and will uh, solve my problem again, right? Cool. And so we've eliminated that boilerplate, right? We don't have to that, make that event co product. And that's cool. Um, but there's still a bunch of boilerplate, right? We still need to write this API definition by hand, and we still need to write the imp uh, API implementation by hand. <laughs> um, but it seems like we can, uh, we can kind of improve on this, right? Um, because if we could generate either or both of those things automatically, um, that would be great. Um, and now that we have a, a, rep a representation of what type we want at the value level, maybe we can kind of incorporate that into our API and then do more sorcery to get the whole thing to work. Um, great, so we have a chance. And so we're going to change our API. And instead of having this big like hard-coded list of all the types I can inject, what I can do is I can write a capture, right? And so I'm going to just like try to parse part of my URL as an event type. And if that succeeds, then I have this as a parameter to my, to my endpoint, right? Um, and so I've changed my API, so I need to change the implementation. Um, and so now, I have this new event type coming in, right? And this is the type um, that the user has told me that uh, of the data that they want to provide to me, right? So I can take it here. I got this uh, et, and I say, okay, same logic as before, right? I'm going to attempt to uh, parse this thing as an et, and I'm good to go, right? Uh, and as you notice from the title of the slide, this might not work. And the problem is, uh, we don't have an instance from from JSON for payload et. Um, and this actually isn't the problem. This is just bad error messages on GHC's part. Um, and so uh, the problem actually is that, oh, we've gone too far. The problem is that this exists at the value level, this ET. And this ET exists at the type level. And those are different namespaces. So these aren't actually referring to the same thing, even though they're the same identifier. Um, and it seems like we're kind of stuck, right? Like, how can we move a thing from the value level to the type level? Um, we don't really have a way, um, but we will. <laughs> Um, and so uh, if we can solve that problem, then we can solve this problem, and then uh, our API will write itself is kind of the idea, right? Uh, so uh, we're going to take our second uh, foray into sorcery, and this is going to be on singletons, and uh, we're going to go through it pretty briefly. Um, and so the good news is if you don't understand singletons, maybe you'll have some idea of what's going on. And the good news is if, uh, if you do understand singletons, we'll go through it very briefly, so you'll only be bored for a very small amount of time, hopefully. <laughs> And so we're going to consider unit, right? Uh, unit is this thing. Oh, actually, and before we dive in, is like if you know what a singleton is, like Java uh, or some object-oriented thing, completely forget about that. It's not the same. It's very different, and that'll mislead you. So, um, so let's consider the unit type, right? Um, we have type unit and we have value unit, and there's only a single value in type unit, which means if we know the value, we know the type, and if we know the type, we know what value must have, and that sounds like a bijection between the values and the types, right? Um, and so that's kind of cool. Um, so in this very limited case, we can move information from the value levels to the type system and back. Uh, and so singletons are a generalization of this. Um, and so for each type uh, that we want to lift from the value to the type system, we can make a new type, uh, which has a single value at the value level, right? And so then we have this bijection, uh, and we can move things back and forth. Sounds crazy. Don't worry. There's an example. 
Um, oh, but before we do, it sounds a lot like data kinds, right? Where we made a new type for every value. Um, and unfortunately, these are not the same types, which is really, really terrible. Um, the problem is data kinds are not of kind star, so they can't exist at the value level. They don't exist at runtime, right? Um, so uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but we need to kind of double, double our efforts here. Um, the good news is we got the data kinds for free, so it's not really too much more work. Um, so uh, the, the way that this works is we make a type family. And so we say this thing is called sing, and it, uh, it takes some a of kind k. And we say k, k here is polymorphic. For any kind you care about, you can provide instances of this type family. Um, and so that means we can have lifted strings living together with lifted ints, living together with lifted whatever you want in this, uh, in this type family. Um, and then we, uh, we do some like ad hoc polymorphism, which means type classes, which means uh, we've got this thing called sing kind, which says, and it takes a kind parameter, which is weird, right? We shouldn't be able to do that. But we've turned on type and type, which moves kinds into the type system, and it, there's no distinction between them anymore. Uh, essentially, in mathematics, it says set is a member of itself, which sounds like uh, it's going to lead to some paradoxes. And it does, but the good news is we're not going to run into them. And apparently, we can't even run into them, according to Richard Eisenberg. <laughs> uh, so there might be some gotchas, but I don't think there are. Um, so sing kind uh, has two, two functions in it, right? We got this from sing and to sing. And kind of what this represents is an isomorphism between the type k and the kind k. So uh, from sync says, if you give me some singleton of kind k, I can give you a value of type k, right? Uh, where these, this is to the same thing at the type level versus the kind level. And two sync goes the other way. If you give me a value of type k, I will give you a singleton of kind k. Um, but you notice this isn't a singleton of kind k. This is a sum sync of k. And the problem is, um, if you give me like Boolean true as a value here, right? Um, then I want to return singleton of lifted true. But if you give me false, I want to give you singleton of list, lifted false. And those are not the same type. And so there's no way to implement this thing if I, if I directly return the singleton. Um, so I write the sum sing instead. And this kind of hides what type is inside of it. I know it's of the right kind, and I can't inspect it. Um, and uh, this is actually the exact same trick we used when we, uh, when we used our event to generate that, that code product for free. We just said, I'll take whatever. I'm going to forget what it's inside of it, but I know kind of what shape it has. And so that's the exact same trick we use here. Um, so uh, we'll go through an example of Booleans, right? That's our favorite example. Um, so I can say, I have a singleton, which is parameterized over the lifted data kind true, right? Um, and that thing has a data constructor called S true, singleton true, right? Um, and likewise, I have the same thing for false. I've got some value at the, at the type level, or sorry, at the term level, which corresponds one to one with this thing at the type level. I then I need to write a bool uh, sing kind instance. And I say, from sing, right? You give me some singleton, I will inspect it. If it's true, then I'll give you true, right? If it's false, I'll give you false. Um, so this is uh, the one way of the isomorphism. The other way, you give me a Boolean, uh, and I'll say, is it true? OK, I'll give you some sing of s true, other some sing of s false. There's nothing interesting happening here, right? It's all just pattern matching of like different symbols that just happen to exist at different places. Um, but what's interesting here is right, what this, this sing kind says is I have, um, I have a bijection between my values of, kind, of type k and the singletons of kind k. right? And I also have this singleton thing here. And what this is is a bijection uh, from my singletons to my types, my, my data kinds. And the good news is that bijections are transitive. So what this in total says is I can move my values to the type level and back automatically. That's all I've done. Uh, we had to do a bunch of math to prove it, but now we can do this, right? Um, but you look at this and like, this is a lot of work. I don't want to have to write this by hand. And the good news is you don't have to. There's template Haskell. Uh, there's a library called Singletons. Um, and what it does is it gives you template Haskell, and it says, you just write the, the data stuff you want, and I'll generate all this crap for you. Nice. <laughs> um, so we got our data kinds for free, and we essentially got our singletons for free as well. And so now we've got this, uh, this bijection uh, from the type level to the term level and back uh, for free. Uh, so you know, obviously, we can do this for uh, the thing we care about, which is our event type. right? We can say we want to move all these things. We want to be able to lift them from values to types and back. Uh, and we're good. 
Uh, and there is this helper function called with some sing, which we're going to use. And essentially what it does is it just forgets about that some sing construction where we're like, we don't know what's inside of it. Who knows? Um, so I'm going to give you a type, a value of type k. And you're going to give me back a singleton of that kind. Um, but you're not going to tell me what it is. And so I have to be able to handle it polymorphically. So if I can handle it polymorphically, it means I can handle it regardless of what type you give me. And I'm going to, for any type you give me, I'm going to give you back an R. Um, and so this kind of solves that problem. Um, and so this is kind of the helper method we need. Uh, we, we're not going to dive too much into it, but it, it turns out uh, we're just going to use it on the next slide. So that's why we're talking about it. Uh, we're going to go back to our regularly scheduled talk. And you've probably, again, forgotten what we're trying to do. <laughs> um, and so remember, we, uh, we took an event type as an enum, as a value, from our API. So this is provided by the user. And then they're also going to give us a JSON blob. And so we want to take that JSON blob and attempt to parse it as the type described by the, uh, the thing that they told us what type it should be. Um, and so we're kind of delegating our type, uh, type checking like, to the user to runtime, right? Like we're, we're doing type checking somehow at runtime, somehow, right? Um, which is neat. And uh, I'm not going to talk about how it works or why, but I think it's worth thinking about. And if you get stumped, uh, maybe ask around later. <laughs> um, so we can go back and we can implement this endpoint that we've been trying to implement like, the, whole, the whole time, right? And so I can say, I have this event type. And this is my enum. And I can say, uh, I'm going to lift that into a singleton, right? I don't actually care about the value of the singleton. I just care about the type of the singleton. And so what that does is it introduces this et type, which is the same as this one. And so now these things are, this isn't just kind of floating in the ether. This is actually represented by um, some concrete type somewhere that we don't know about, right? Um, and so we're, we're feeling very clever. And now this looks like it'll compile. And we press the compile button. And it still doesn't work. And it still doesn't work for the same problem. <laughs> uh, and that's, um, that's kind of lame. But now, remember we said last time that this error was misleading. And now this error is no longer misleading. This is actually the, the real problem of what's going on. And the problem is uh, we don't have a from JSON instance, right? Um, we actually don't know what this ET is until runtime. And so like, the compiler doesn't even know that we, have, that we can um, run this from JSON function, right? We don't know if we have that dictionary. And so usually the, the solution to this problem is you kind of add a constraint here. You say, I have a from JSON for ET, or for payload of ET. But there's a problem, and that problem is et doesn't exist in the type signature. It only exists in our function because it comes from the user. It doesn't exist at compile time. It only exists at runtime. Whoa. <laughs> um, so it's not super clear where we can put this constraint or how we can get it, right? Um, but if we had it, then we would be able to call this and everything would work hunky dory. We're so, so close. There's a few more things we need to do, right? But we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, so the thing is, we know that we have a from JSON instance for everything over payload. We know that this is a total function. But the compiler doesn't, because the compiler isn't as smart as we are. Um, so we need to figure out some way of proving this to the compiler. And as we've seen, it's, it seems hard to prove at the type level. Um, and so I've got a solution for this. And it's hard at the type level. Try to just do it at the term level. And in this case, it actually works. Um, so uh, what's going on here? It's wild. We have. <laughs> We have the constraints we want, right? So this says, I have a from JSON over everything in my payload, or every, everything in my kind, right? And then if you give me a singleton of the event type kind, I will give you back a proof uh, that I have this from JSON over this payload. Um, and what this dict is, it's like a, it's a value level representation of a constraint. And so this says, um, I have a from JSON proof, and I can pass it around at, uh, at the value level. And so um, if I can write this function, then I can get a proof at the type at the value level, and I can just kind of use that. So if we can write this function, we can solve that other problem, and we can solve all our problems. Um, and it turns out this is like one of the easiest things to implement. Um, I actually got this trick from my coworker Renzo Carbonara, who's like brilliant and actually pretty much taught me all of this type level wizardry. Uh, so shout out to that guy; he's brilliant. Um, we'll do a little more at the end because it turns out all of this is implemented in the library of his. Um, so uh, the implementation of this dict from JSON is this. I get some singleton. I pattern match on it. And then in each case, I return dict. And it seems like we should be able to just make this an underscore and return dict, right, if it's the same in each case. But the problem is each one of these dictionaries uh, has a different type. Um, so if we look at it, we say, OK, if I know that this is a single wake up, right, that means that this, is, uh, this A is wake up, which means that this A is also wake up. <laughs> 
which means I want to give a proof that I have this wake up. And so what this dict is actually referring to is this constraint here, all the way across, right? And likewise for each of these things. So actually, unfortunately, this isn't a boilerplate I do need to write. And as far as I know, there's no way to abstract over this, um, unfortunately. But with this thing in place, I can now uh, use this to get the proof that I'm allowed to parse this thing that I want to parse, right? So I now have my with some sing, and I used to be ignoring the singleton I got, but now I need it because I need to pass it into that function in order to get the proof that I'm doing it, right? So I take that thing and I call my function, and that gives me back a proof that I'm allowed to do it. I need to pattern match on it, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, but pattern matching on the thing brings that constraint from the value level into the constraint system, right? Hi. So that would work if it was underscore. <coughs> that, uh, no, it would not work if it were underscore. Yeah. Um, and so that just kind of introduces that constraint into scope, which means that this from JSON can find it, which means that we can parse this thing as an event type payload ET. Everything works. Hi. Do we still need uh, ambiguous types? Um, we do not need ambiguous types anymore. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Sorry. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, and so uh, the implementation of this is actually really dumb, and just kind of encodes it as a gadget. And uh, it's it's in a package called Constraints, uh, which I highly recommend looking at. It's great, and uh, you'll probably learn some things about how the constraint system does sorcery. So uh, there was one more question. So there's yeah, so we do need to write that by hand, and there is some boilerplate there. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, it definitely could be done with ha template Haskell. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, but we could, for sure. We could write that. It hasn't been done, but I don't see why it couldn't be. So thanks for pointing that out, actually. Uh, so um, we, uh, we now just say our server just serves this endpoint. And we're done, right? It's groovy. Sweet. It works. Uh, and so what we've done is we've got this like compiler-driven coding, right, where um, we cannot possibly do this wrong anymore. Um, so we say, oh, I want to add a new event, right? A new like payload, and I have to write that as an instance of my data family. And the only way I can do that is if I add it to my enum, which automatically hooks it up to the API, right? Um, and if I don't do that, then my uh, dict from JSON function is no longer exhaustive, and so it won't compile anymore, right? And so there's no way to do this wrong. And also, if I forget to add a from JSON instance, then this function. Uh, doesn't the constraint solver says you've done it wrong, and so it still doesn't compile. So I have to add a from JSON instance. Cool. So that means I've pretty much gotten rid of all the boilerplate. I still need to write my data types. Um, I still need to write from JSON instances, but I don't have to make that giant uh, code product anymore. And now my both my server uh, API uh, definition and the implementation will write themselves. And so I'm down to a quarter of the original work I had to do. Right. And um, I don't think we can get any further, because at some point, someone needs to describe what data we want. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's still going to be us. Um, but uh, I think we've come a long way, right? Um, but this is only half of the problem, right? We've ingested the data, we've type checked it, but we still need to send it downstream. And um, I know it seems wild, but we're so close. Don't worry, we're so close. There's light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there. There's just a few more problems we're going to run to, uh, but nothing, nothing hard. <coughs> Um, so for simplicity, we're still going to encode these things as JSON. Um, and since we just wrote a from JSON thing, we're probably going to need to do the same thing for to JSON, right? And you know the drill, right? We write the same thing. We write this big boilerplate thing, and it says, oh, we've got to JSON for everything. And if you give me a thing, I'll give you back a proof of to JSON, um, which is fine. But if you, look at this, uh, if you look at this implementation, this is actually identical to this, the last implementation we wrote. All, of, all the interesting things are happening behind the scenes implicitly in the types. Um, and so this is kind of lame, though, because now I have to write two identical functions, and the only difference is what constraint they have, right? Um, and generally, as programmers, we kind of know how to solve this problem. If we have two things that are the same, we can kind of parameterize over that, right? Um, and so we just replace that constraint with some C, some polymorphic constraint. In order to do that, we need to turn on constraint kinds. Um, but uh, this is it, right? The only thing that's changed is our type signature. Our implementation is exactly the same. And so <coughs> this says, I can get a, a dictionary um, for any constraint that is total over my payload, right? 
if, uh, so that means I can get eek for free, I can get ord for free, I can get anything for free as long as it works over every payload. Um, and so now I don't need to keep like multiple copies of to JSON from JSON, I just write this one function. And so this is some boilerplate I need to write. I could template Haskell a little way, um, and probably should. Um, but this is cool, right? I'm, I'm, there's less work I need to do now. I can to JSON from JSON, I can do whatever I want with this one function. Um, and so we can use it to implement to JSON, right, to over events, which is will let us stick it downstream. I say, okay, um, I've got to JSON. I'm going to destructure my make event. I guess it gets me a payload. If I call to JSON on that payload, and uh, that's it, right? To JSON of this is equal to to JSON of that. Um, and if you're paying attention, you're like, no, it doesn't. That doesn't work. <laughs> um, because we have a, a function that takes a singleton and then gives back that proof. And then we need to pattern match, and then that gives us the proof, right? So the proof isn't in scope yet. Um, and um, that's cool, but we need a singleton to get that dictionary, and we don't have one. Because we, we used to have it, but we, we didn't record it. We threw it away. We didn't think we needed it. Uh, and it turns out we do. Uh, and so there's a really easy fix, right? Is when we construct this thing, we'll just keep the singleton that we used to construct it. <coughs> so I changed my make event, and so now it takes a singleton of type ET, of kind event type, and it takes a payload over the same thing. So these, uh, the compiler is smart enough to know that these are the same type, even when it hides them away. And uh, I'll give you back on that, right? So now I've, I've made this essentially a pair of a singleton and a payload over that singleton. Uh, and so we're so close. We're almost there. I can write my two JSON instance for event, right? Um, I, take, I destructure my event, so I get my singleton and my payload. I use the singleton to get uh, the proof of a two JSON. Here I do need, um, I guess I do need ambiguous type still. So I type apply this. Tells me what constraint I want, right? Uh, the type checker goes back and says, yep, you can do that. It gives you back the dict. We pattern match on that. That brings it into scope. And now I can say, I want to construct a JSON object, right, whose type. Uh, so we just we ran into a problem where we didn't keep the singleton around. So it seems like we probably want to keep that, right? So that's why we're serializing it here, right? We turn a singleton back into uh, an event type of kind star. And we can stick it in this payload, um, or in this like JSON object. And we can also then just uh, immediately like to JSON our payload. And that's what this does. And so this kind of nestles that thing in here. And so now this thing is well typed, right? We can deserialize this later. Um, we're actually not going to write the from JSON instance, but it's it's pretty much the similar uh, kind of. You have to go. It's a little more involved because you have to um, pull out the the type, right? Turn it into a singleton, and then use that to get the the payload from from JSON. So it's a little more work, but you can do it. Um, and with that, we're actually done. We've, we've solved all our problems. We've existentialized away a lot of things. The code will write itself for us in almost all cases. Um, and uh, it's probably worth thinking about like how much of this is applicable outside of my dumb toy example, right? Um, and the first thing to, to realize is we didn't invent this uh, event type. This like clever thing where we were like, oh, we'll just hide, uh, we'll just hide the payload and we'll uh, we'll deal with it later. Um, we realized we needed the singleton, right? We need to keep track of what type that thing was. Um, and so in the literature, this is known as a dependent pair, which is kind of neat. Like we, we just kind of bumbled our way through it, and we came up with something that like is in the literature, which implies we didn't invent this thing. We discovered it. Pretty cool. Um, and so in the literature, this thing is written as this spooky looking math Greek thing, right? It's some sigma over A of event type of payload A. And this probably doesn't mean a lot uh, when you first like it's like weird. Um, but if you remember from like high school algebra, um, a sigma is like re repeated addition, right? It ranges over every a in this domain, and it will add all those things together, right? So it says like a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus all the way up to an, right? And if you squint and you remember like algebraically your data types, um, addition means like a coproduct. This thing turns out to be isomorphic to our original event. And that uh, turns out to be why, why we actually found it, um, because this thing is isomorphic to that thing we were writing by hand. <coughs> um, and so right, this, this looks familiar. Like, this is an original thing, and this thing uh, is a bunch of additions over every possible payload, which is the same as this thing. right? Uh, yeah, and so um, these things are completely isomorphic, one to one, um, except I had to do less work for one of them, except I had to do a little more conceptual work, but less physical work. right? I think that's a that's a good thing for our for our uh, careers. Um, so more generally, this thing is a, a thing called it's a it's a pair, right? It's some pair of A and B of this type, 
Um, and so A is of type big A, but B is of type F of A, of lowercase a, right? And so this is, um, this is a type that depends on the value of the first thing in my pair. We, we encoded this as a singleton because um, we had that uh, bijection. Um, but independent Haskell, one day, hopefully, we want to do all this weird singleton data kind tricks. It'll all just work for us. Um, and so we can encode this thing directly in Haskell. Um, I will have like three more slides, so just like we're, we're holding in, right? We're almost there. Um, and so there's a, there's a library uh, called exinst, um, which defines this thing called someone. And this thing turns out to be the dependent pair that we want. Um, and that's why this talk has been called someone a little mysteriously. And so that takes some type level function, which takes uh, kind k and returns kind star, or kind type, uh, same thing. And what that thing is is a pair of a singleton of that kind and um, a type over that value, right? Um, and so this thing is completely the same. And so once we have this, um, I can say that my event type is actually just the someone over a payload. Cool. You need to do some like naming tricks to like, because our constructors are now the wrong names, but these things are exactly the same. Um, we have one other thing is we have that dict payload thing, which was like the only way we were actually able to use these things usefully. Um, and so uh, there's also this, this ad hoc polymorphism, right? Type classes called dict1. And it takes a constraint of kind output to constraint and a function from, type, uh, from kind input to output. And you're just looking at these things and like these things are kind aligned, right? And so it seems like we should probably compose them because that, that output will disappear. Um, and that's exactly what this is, right? If we have some f of a and then a c of an f of a, that thing takes an, uh, an input and it gives me back a constraint, which makes this thing kind check. And so um, dict1 is a function which takes a singleton and will provide um, some c. So generally when we write this thing, we keep, uh, like when we keep write instances of this, we keep c polymorphic for the same trick that we used earlier and so we didn't have to write a bunch of these things. Hi. Yeah, and so well, so uh, so dict is a, uh, a thing that whose kind is constraint to star, and so uh, we compose input with an to an output to a constraint to a star, and then if you work all that out, it actually does uh, type check, kind check. But thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's that's pretty much it. Um, the good news is all of this stuff comes preassembled. We worked through it together because if you just look at this library, it's like, what does any of this crap do? Uh, it's very overwhelming. It took me too many, too many months of my life to figure out. Uh, but it's a package called Exinst, short for Existential Instances. Um, and uh, that's it. Uh, it also provides um, the capabilities to lift dict1 over someone. And so we can say if we have um, an equality, like a dict1 of eek, right? We, if we have equality for everything inside of our payload, then we should be able to lift that to equality over our existentialized payload. Uh, so that's it. Thank you for listening.